Pastor Joe. Over to you, Pastor Joe. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a blessing again to gather together to study God's word. I get excited when I study God's word. Um, it, it is such a blessing to hear and meditate upon what God has for me in his word. Every word of God in the Bible is his will. And I also want to welcome tonight a number of the members and attendees of the Bay Area Agape Fellowship. Welcome. We're glad to have you join us tonight. And so let's dive right into it. We've been studying the book of First John. So if you have a Bible, please open it and turn to First John chapter 1. <clears throat> First John chapter 1. I'll be reading the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. We now come to verse 4 of chapter 1 in this news verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 1 John. And so the title and theme of the book is Fellowship with God in Life, Light, and Love. And the key verse is 1 John 1.3, which we looked at last time and we'll be referring back to 1 John 1.3, is that truly our fellowship with the Father is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The main theme of the epistle of 1 John is fellowship with God. I've said it a thousand times. That is why we were created. That is the purpose of our conversion, our salvation. And this is the object, meaning, and goal of our Christian life, to enjoy communion and fellowship with God. This will be our eternal vocation. There will not be any time, the Bible says, that we will not be in complete oneness with and fellowship with God. Now, I know we have a lot of trials and tribulations in this life. We suffer much, but just think about it for a moment. Let's pause from our sufferings for a second. You and I as a Christian, a born again Christian, will enjoy eternal, never ending, unfathomable fellowship with the living God who is full of inexhaustible light, who is light, who is love, and who is life. It boggles the mind to conceive of that, but that's what we are told. Fellowship with God, and God wants to enjoy us to enjoy fellowship with him in this world as his people, not only as a means of compensation and comfort in our trials and tribulations, but for its own sake, fellowship with God to the end that we might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Fellowship with the living God who upholds all things by the word of his power. The God who created us, who has fed us simultaneous with upholding the universe by his mighty power. Now the apostle John's first epistle shatters any misunderstandings we may have about true conversion, about sin, knowing God, love, obedience, prayer, spiritual life, the world, false spirits, and much more. While opening our eyes to these great truths, he brings enlightenment 
conviction and encouragement to us. But most of all, 1 John is a call to Christ's church to have fellowship with God. Fellowship is the heart of our relationship with God. It's the heart of our eternal purpose. Fellowship with God is the goal of all of our missions activities and our evangelistic outreach and all of our service. It's to see people becoming saved and to have those people enter into the beginning of an eternal union with God himself in everlasting fellowship. So I ask you, do you have fellowship with God every day? Is fellowship with God an identifiable goal for you? Not just every day, but for your whole life. Do you understand the absolute priority that God has for his church, both corporately, collectively, and individually of fellowship with God? He doesn't commune with buildings and organizations and confessions of faith. He has spiritual intimacy with human beings made in his image who have been given God-given intellects and emotions and spirits for the design purpose of being raised from the dead, being quick, quickened and equipped from above to enter into this glorious and mysterious communion and union with the living God himself. Do you understand that that is your purpose and mine? That is your function and mine as Christians. I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? Well, then your number one job is not your earthly vocation. It's not going shopping and fulfilling your checklist, although those things are necessary. Those we have to do as parentheses between our times of walking with God. But your greatest desire should be, and our greatest zeal should impinge upon fellowship with God. We should have many times, frequent times, where we can't wait to open our Bible and to pray and to walk with God. However difficult that may be in starting out, However difficult it may be in persevering in that fellowship, yet the spirit of God planted within our hearts longs and craves to know God, to walk with him, and to have heavenly communion with him. Can you resonate with that? Does your spirit testify that that is your number one desire? I hope so. I hope so. Because God is in the business of giving his people the desire of his heart, of their hearts, as long as they're conformed to God's will. Because that is God's will. His number one will for his people is to fellowship with him. And so our text today, as we continue in our exposition of 1 John, is verse 4, the next verse. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. What does this verse mean? I'm writing this to you, the Apostle John says, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that your joy may be full. He's saying to us, the reason and purpose that he's writing to us, the reason why the Holy Spirit of God inspired the Apostle, the reason why this truth in Scripture is God-breathed and given to John to pass on through writing to Christians of every generation is because it's God's desire and will that your joy and mine would be full. God doesn't delight to see his people walking around constantly with morbid and morose spirits, never having any compensation of joy from above. He's writing the scripture to teach us how to have that joy, to encourage us to partake frequently in that joy, to remind us that he has given us 
his Holy Spirit to provide that fresh joy from above. What a wonderful verse this is. And what does, and why does the apostle John write about fellowship? That's the main theme of the Bible. And that's the main theme of 1 John. 1 John repeats the main theme of the Bible many, many, many times. More than any other books, I think, in the Bible, as short as the length is of 1 John, percentage-wise, proportionally, the theme of fellowship is repeated more than any other book uh, in the Bible. And the reason is that our joy may be full. Fellowship with God should always lead to some amount of joy. Let me ask you a question. When you read your Bibles, do you sometimes feel joy? When you meditate on the glorious truths that the Holy Spirit opens for you as you meditate on the scripture, do you have a smidgen of joy sometimes? When you pray to the Lord and you freshly remember the attributes of Christ, the love of Christ, the sacrifice and atoning work of Christ on your behalf. Does your heart well up with joy? Well, there's a reason for that. It's God's intention to have you partake of his joy. He wants you to taste of it. He wants to remind you with tokens of joy, what awaits you in heaven in spite of your trials. That's a glorious fact, my brother. You see, in the book of 1 John, the apostle has a lot to say about the world. One of our three main enemies, which is the lust of the flesh, the, uh, the pride of life, and, and um, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, that's five enemies, but among the world, the flesh, and the devil, the world is one of those enemies. And John has a lot to say about the world in 1 John. But frequently, the antithesis, the opposite of the world, which we are reminded of is a remedy for our suffering while we're in the world, is the joy of the Lord. And he, John emphasizes that the world is not capable of providing the joy of the Lord. The world has a false joy, a temporal excitement about futile, vain, and perishable things. But this joy is given by the Holy Spirit, not by anything in the world. And if we get excited about something in the world, we need to think twice about that. Because everything of this world is vain and perishing. Now, the joy of the Lord, as I suggested, springs from fellowship with God, which is the theme of the, of the epistle and the purpose of salvation. And I think Pastor Owen earlier maybe had an inkling of <clears throat> what this study is gonna be about. Maybe he is thinking that where we left off at verse three, Joe is gonna continue in verse four. And he began to pray at least three or four times in his prayer about the joy of the Lord. I noticed that. And I prayed with him about that because I knew what the theme of this study would be. And so I don't believe in prophecy or premonitions as, as a gift, but I think uh, the Lord led Pastor Owen in his prayer and me tonight in my teaching to be on the same page, the joy of the Lord. I think of those first century Christians who were persecuted, who were burnt at the stake, who were nailed to crosses, who were thrown to the lions, who were deprived food, who went hungry, they lived in caves, they were persecuted, they were, uh, their families were taken away, their possessions were, were stolen. But in the midst of all of that, the Holy Spirit gave them joy. And you and I, 2,000 years later, here we are in, in similar circumstances where suffering and persecution and 
political and economic upheaval and uncertainty on a level and fear and doubt on levels that we have not seen in decades and many generations are flooding back into our daily consciousness and awareness. And we see on the horizon, things don't look very good. We hear so much about the signs of the times and the second coming of Christ. And we see that men's hearts are failing them for fear of the things that are coming on the earth. But God's promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit to fill Christians, his people, those who are born from above, those who love Christ, those who have put all their eggs in one basket spiritually, those who have laid their lives down at the feet of Christ, those who have laid their lives down on the altar of sacrifice, service, and dedication of our all to him are promised by God that we can have the joy of the Lord. And we do have some of that joy in the worst of circumstances so that no matter how things get in the future, no matter how bad they get, we are promised the joy of the Lord as our strength. Do you believe that? I know you do. I know you do. So let's look away from our troubles for a minute. And let's remember this glorious promise of joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into it tonight. And whatever trouble and despair and depression and discouragement you may be experiencing, remember, God presents a platter to you. And on that platter are the fruits of the Spirit. And one of them, the second greatest on the list, is the joy of the Holy Spirit. Or the third on the list, love, peace, joy. Joy. And that joy, I believe, will strengthen us and carry us through. The Holy Spirit is such a great expert in reminding us of doctrines and truths connected with our salvation, connected with our assurance and our eternal security, connected with the promise that we cannot lose our salvation and that God will never leave us nor forsake us and that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. The Holy Spirit is a master at pulling up truth concerning the blessedness and the preservation and perseverance of our salvation to excite us and to remind us while we're in the fiery furnace of affliction that nothing of this earth can pluck us out of the Father's hand Nothing, not height, not length, not depth, not Satan, not hell, not demons, not the government, not threats of loss of any kind, not the loss of a job, not the loss of health, not old age, not friends betraying us, the joy of the Lord through all of it, even tenfold more than that will see us through because the Holy Spirit in his way, internally, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that I am a child of God. I am a child of the King. I have been born again. My sins are forgiven. Christ awaits me in heaven with open arms. The spirits of just men made perfect are waiting for me to join them in heaven. My white robes are being prepared. And these thoughts and these truths of the future, eternal life and bliss with Christ are given to us by way of reminder by the blessed Holy Ghost of God to see us through everything, everything that will come against us. So my brother, my sister, take heart, be encouraged, because you and I have a mediator in heaven that is always praying for us, always sending forth the Holy Spirit to protect us and guard us and revive us and draw us back to himself with cords of love. This is a source of great joy to know that he's done it in the past. 
He's doing it now, whether you feel like it or know it or not, and he will keep doing it until we stand before him, blameless before him on that last day. I'm so excited right now about the joy of the Lord. If I wasn't wearing a belt, I think I'd float through the ceiling. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm so glad I'm in the company of my brothers and sisters, the saints of God that, that know what I'm talking about is true from scripture and that can rejoice with me that in Christ, we have a reservoir and a well of joy that is promised to us and is given to us. Amen? Amen. And so let's look at some of the background on joy in 1 John, or in uh, 1 John as well as in the Gospel of John. Now, remember I told you recently a couple of times in the Sunday sermon and in the Bible study that I'm going to jump back and forth between the Gospel of John and 1 John because the author is the same, the Apostle John, and the major themes of both the Gospel of John and 1 John are the same in both books. These themes are just condensed greatly in 1 John, and they are expanded a lot in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, we have more of the milk of these themes introduced. In the first epistle of John, we have the meat of the word on these themes developed, okay? And so joy is a major theme in the gospel of John. Let's look at joy from the perspective of the evangelist John, same one as the apostle John in the Gospel of John. So in your Bible, turn to chapter 3, verse 29 of the Gospel of John. Don't get confused between the two books. We're talking about the Gospel of John. Keep your finger in 1 John chapter 1 and go all the way to the left to the beginning of the New Testament in, first, in the Gospel of John. Excuse me. John in the gospel talks a lot about joy. In chapter three, verse 29, he says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because he hears the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And so believers hear the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and we rejoice. We have joy. In chapter 15 of, God, of the gospel, John's gospel 15 and verse 11, it says, Jesus says, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Another purpose statement. John says the same thing in 1 John 1, 4, our very text. He says, these things I've written to you. And now the same apostle in John 15, 11 in the gospel says, these things I've spoken to you. So he's writing to us and he's speaking to us or teaching us that Jesus wants his joy to remain in us and be full. Not to leave us, but to stay inside of us. And at what level? He wants it to be full. Now, remember, the context here in John 15, and then I'm going to show you a verse in chapter 16 and 17. In John chapters 13 through 16, we see our Lord's upper room discourses where he, he experienced <clears throat> and observed the first Lord's Supper with his disciples, and then he laid down a number of upper room teachings and sayings that basically all reviewed the pri spiritual priorities of his three and a half years of teaching ministry on earth. He reviewed all the major spiritual discourses and doctrines of his earthly ministry. And in chapters 13 through 16, we find three verses on joy. Now, remember, the apostles, 11 of them are up there. Judas Iscariot went out and hugged himself. So there's 11 of them up there and they're discouraged. They're hearing 
things like uh, from the Lord saying like, I'm going to be taken from you. The son of man is going to be crucified. He's going to be, he's going to be uh, mistreated and cruelly treated. And the disciples are starting to get sorrow in their hearts. And what does he say to them? He says, these things have I spoken to you that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. I can imagine old impetuous Peter. He wasn't old at that time, but I can imagine him thinking or responding, Lord, Lord, why do you have to leave us? Why are they, why are they taking you? I'm discouraged. I'm sorrowful. But then I can imagine in my imaginary uh, conversation between Peter and Jesus, the Lord Jesus say, don't worry. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so that the joy you had in me and with me while I was with you will still be in you and with you. That same joy will be in you and with you, no matter how bad things get. I'm not going to take my joy from you. It will remain in you and your joy will be full. Can I say something to you tonight? Look. The brand of Christianity in America is a kind of Christianity that lacks a lot of joy. But the Lord promises that no matter where the church may lack, where we may grow lean or apostate or weak, God promises individual believers as well as individual churches that if you put your trust in the Lord's hands, you trust his promise to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he will do it no matter how bad things get concerning the larger evangelical church or Christendom at large around the world. These promises are meant to be reduced to the individual level and to the individual church level. So let us be encouraged to press on individually, lay hold of these promises of joy, uh, for our individual walk and lives, as well as in our local churches, even, even this coming Lord's Day at our prayer meeting. And when we pray in our Wednesday night prayer meeting, let us bring these promises of the Holy Spirit's joy before the church, before the brethren. Let us remind the brethren to join us in prayer at the prayer meeting to claim God's promise that he has given to us. We didn't create these promises out of nothing. We didn't dictate to God, oh, by the way, God, in the book of 1 John, make sure you write four times in there the promise of joy or in the gospel. No, he initiated these promises. He wants us to have joy or else he would have never written us about it and promised to give us this joy unless he, it was part of his will for us. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, let us have joy. And in chapter 16 of John's gospel, look at verse 24. Look at verse 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. What? That your joy may be full. The Lord tells us to ask him for joy. Now, God doesn't tease us. He doesn't tell us to ask him for something and then not give it to us. He doesn't dangle a carrot in front of our eyes. And then when we reach for it, he pulls it away and says, aha, 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 aha. God doesn't play games. He gives us a promise for a reason. And he wants us to ask that we might receive. He wants us to knock and it will be open to us. He wants us to seek so that we can find what he's asking us to ask him for. Look at chapter 17. Remember, these first two verses in John 15 and 16, he's encouraging the disciples who are dispirited. Jesus is going to be taken from them. And he says, I'm not going to take my joy from you. My joy will remain in you. Your joy will be full. Ask me and you will receive joy to the full. And then in John 17, what does he do? In his highest priestly prayer, he prays that they would have joy 
He prays for them to have joy in verse 13 of John 17. He prays to the Father, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, why is Jesus going to pray for us to have something like joy and it not be given? Every prayer that Jesus prayed was answered. Oh, my brethren, this is encouraging, is it not? Highlight these verses in your Bible in John 15, 16, and 17. If you're a highlighter, if you're like me, um, you're one of those who highlight profound verses that stand out to me or promises like this. Keep them in mind. Bring them before the Lord during your prayer time. Write them down on your prayer list. Start to pray about them. Lord, I need more joy in my life. I haven't experienced joy in a while, Lord, and I'm going through trials right now. You know how discouraged I am. Oh, Lord, increase my joy. Lord, you promised. You promised here. It's, you told me right here in John 15 and John 16 and John 17. Lord, are not these promises mine? Make them individual. Claim them for your own as if you were the only person in the whole world. Lord, tell the Lord, Lord, didn't you give me this promise? Please, Lord. Pour out floods of joy on the parched ground of my heart, and I'll praise you, and I'll be quick to magnify your holy name. Moving on then, joy is depicted in the Bible as a normal and regular Christian experience in the epistles. Joy is not only for second-tier Christians, super-Christians. And by the way, there's no such thing as a super Christian. <laughs> when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us upon conversion. Who do you think converts us? Who do you think regenerates us? Who do you think comes inside of us and gives us a new nature, a new heart? Who do you think changes us from the inside out? Who do you think stays with us from that time forward? The Holy Spirit. And how can we have joy unless the Holy Spirit is inside of us, rekindling joy with our spirit and in our spirit? And if he commands us like he does in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, turn over to, to 1 Thessalonians 5.16, where he says, rejoice always. If he commands us to rejoice always, he will give us grace to do it. One of my favorite verses, turn there, is 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1.8. <clears throat> Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, <clears throat> yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Oh, I love the synonyms that describe joy. It, they're inexpressible. It's inexpressible and full of glory. Were you ever filled with the joy of the Lord? Where you just loved the Lord so much, you couldn't even express it. It was joy inexpressible. God took your speech away and you're just shaking your head. <laughs> Lord, this is glorious. This is wonderful. And your heart at that moment is full of glory. The joy is overflowing. And you're glorying in the things of Christ. You're reveling in joy because you have been reminded by the Holy Spirit of the preciousness of Christ in one way or another. And all you can do is glory and rejoice. This blessing is part of our inheritance as believers. This joy is unique, but it's normal for Christians. It's normal. It's not a second work of grace. It's the joy we receive afresh from the Holy Spirit when we walk with God in his word. And when we pray, when we commune with the Lord and talk with the Lord and meditate on the Lord and fill our minds and hearts with the law of the Lord and the word of God and the thoughts of Christ. And when we go down the path from 
to deeper and deeper levels of meditation from one level of meditation upon Christ and the things of Christ and the joys of Christ and the glories of Christ to the next level. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us at that moment. He is dispatched from the Lord Jesus and he opens up the caverns of our mind to the hidden recesses of joy in those things of Christ. And that's why it's so important. If you want more joy in your life, if you want to revel in this great inheritance that God has given us, which is Christ himself, then spend much time in the word of God every day, not just five minutes, spend hour after hour in reading and meditating on the word of God. Set aside all <clears throat> of the things that bring the world in. Shut the world out and bring Christ in through the word. And somewhere along the line in there as you meditate on the scriptures of truth, which point you to a deeper knowledge of Christ, the Holy Spirit, you will find, will quicken you with more joy. Oh, I hope tonight you can rejoice in these things because there is much joy in the Christian faith. Yes, there is persecution, there is suffering. That comes with the normal Christian life, but there is also compensating joy. Before we go any further on the subject of joy, which we're looking at in verse four of First John chapter one, let's step back for a minute and look at the big picture in first John. There's a big picture that we need to constantly review and reiterate in first John. The content of first John is so important that a big picture look is, is critical for us from time to time. The content of first John is critical because it helps us review from time to time to reinforce the very present points I'm making. Now, <clears throat> there are three big ideas that are interwoven in 1 John. There are three big picture truths that are interwoven and interlaced in 1 John that the apostle constantly reiterates. Okay? And as we review these interrelated truths, we are confronted with practical tests of our Christianity, practical measures to see if we have the joy, if we are Christians, okay? And we read in 1 John chapter 5, turn back, you should have your finger in 1 John, turn back to 1 John, Okay, I'll give you a second to do that because this is very important. First John chapter five and verse 13. This is another one of those statements where he says, these things I have written. There are several of them in first John, purpose statements. This is a purpose statement. And he says in first John five thirteen, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that purpose you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So here's one of those big idea statements in the Gospel of John. One of these purpose statements telling us why he has written 1 John to us. And he's saying that as Christians, we have many doubts we lose the assurance of our salvation. We backslide from time to time. Uh, and God wants us to make sure that we're a true Christian and our joy is revived from time to time. And to have joy return, we need to go through a series of tests that, that God would apply to our hearts to bring back as we test and examine ourselves as Christians, the joy of the Lord. And for those who are only false brethren and professing Christians, these tests will help them 
discover that they are not saved, that they are not converted, they're Christians in name only and not in truth, and it will help them and lead them to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and so that they can set aside religion as their religion and bring Christ in as their faith and their joy and their salvation. <clears throat> now, the, let me give you three of these big tests, okay, that you're going to find are repeated in 1 John through all five chapters. These three tests are scattered throughout the book several times, okay, and they have to do with practical Christianity. They have to do with your walk and your relationship with God, because everything is about relationship. The whole, the whole Bible is about relationship because the intention of the Bible is to bring us into, first of all, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then after that, to deepen an ongoing relationship with God until we are taken by the Lord. And that ongoing relationship based on the saving relationship is described in 1 John as fellowship fellowship that's the main theme of first john and the main theme of the bible now one way first and that's one of the big ideas in first john that's repeated over and over and again and it's interwoven with other big ideas which i'll get to in a second now fellowship with god are you following me anybody listening let me make sure you're listening okay you're all there Nobody dropped out yet. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> okay. So fellowship with God, one of these big ideas in 1 John is described in another way. Remember, this is pragmatic Christianity we're talking about. It's described in walking in the light. Walking in the light. And so that brings up a major theme that is a partner with fellowship, but walking in the light is used to describe and define what fellowship with God is, okay? So fellowship with God is equated to walking in the light in the book of 1 John. This is the big idea in the book of 1 John. Fellowship with God is a partner idea with walking in the light. And walking in the light describes in various ways what it means to have fellowship with God. And we'll get into that because in this very chapter, in the next few verses, the idea of light is introduced to serve God's purpose in describing what true fellowship with God is all about okay all right the second big idea in the book of first john <clears throat> is sonship sonship first fellowship and second sonship all right in the within the idea of sonship god wants us to know wants us to know whether or not we are really sons or daughters of God. Are you truly a son of God? Are you truly a child of God or not? Are you truly a daughter of God or not? Because another phrase in the book of 1 John distinguishes between those who are children of God and those who are not children of God. We call this sonship. And he uses the phrase constantly throughout 1 John, he says, many say they know him, but, and then he describes the way they behave, which is unlike a son or a child of God. Many um, say they are children of God, but they do this, that, and the other thing, which suggests they're not children of God. So through this big idea, which is also a test of sonship, a test of whether or not we're a child of God, he juxtaposes or he compares those who say they are sons of God and daughters of God 
to those who just, and are really sons and daughters of God, to those who say they are Christians, say they are children of God, but when applying the test that God gives them, they are found out to be false. They are not true children of God. So this idea of sonship is equated to practicing righteousness. So as fellowship points to the um, partner definition of walking in the light to help us understand what true fellowship is, is, this idea of practicing righteousness helps us pass the test of sonship. It helps us understand that if we are truly a child of God, we will be practicing righteousness. If we're not a child of God, we will not be practicing right, righteousness. That is the big test phrase to discover if we are true children of God or not and pass the test so that we can have this knowledge of God that I read about in 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you know that you have eternal life? How do you know that you are a son, a daughter of God and pass the test? By practicing righteousness. So first big picture idea is fellowship with God, which is tested by walking in the light. Second big, big picture idea in 1 John is sonship, which is determined by passing the test of practicing righteousness. And those two ideas of walking in the light and practicing righteousness are repeated and interwoven throughout the, the book of 1 John. Okay, and here's the, the last big picture idea. The, the third big idea in John is called abiding. Look up how many times the word abiding is mentioned in the book of 1 John. Now, I want to quickly say that this idea of abiding means that you are maintaining your heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. You are walking in the spirit with Jesus Christ. That you, may, you have, are experiencing the fruits of light, life, and love, three other main themes in the book of First John that constantly come up in First John. When you abide with Christ, when you have this spiritual intimacy with him, these three things are going to be renewed in you. His life, his light, and his love. They will reemerge. They will spring up as a well of water unto eternal life within your spirit. Okay? But that's not the key phrase that is the, the helper to understand abiding. The key phrase to understand and to help abiding is faith and love by the Holy Spirit. Faith and love by the Holy Spirit. So just to quickly review, the big idea of fellowship is defined by a secondary phrase, walking in the light. And we'll get into what that means soon in an, another study. The second big idea is sonship, which is strengthened and defined by the term practicing righteousness, which is a phrase woven throughout 1 John. The third big idea is abiding, that is maintaining intimacy with Christ. It's another way of saying fellowship with him, yes, but it has its own aspects to it that are different. So abiding is defined by this idea of the Holy Spirit providing fresh faith in Christ as the son of God and fresh love for the brethren and love for everybody. 
You cannot abide with Christ. You cannot be a true child of God, this idea of sonship, and can, cannot truly have fellowship with God. If you do not love the brethren, you can't abide unless you love the brethren, and, and unless you have faith in the Jesus, the Son of God, as your Savior, and maintain that faith in him your whole life. Okay? Though that definition of abiding is woven through first john repeated frequently saying if you're abiding in him then you can't hate the brethren you must love the brethren if you're abiding in him you cannot deny that jesus christ the son of god you must have faith in him that's how you know you're abiding in him he who says there's that phrase again he who says i am abiding in him but is walking in darkness, but hates his brother, but denies that Jesus is the son of God, does not know God, is not a son or a daughter of God, does not know sonship, is not in fellowship with God. Now I close by asking you a question. Do you now understand how important the book of 1 John is? I read the book of 1 John why? Because I'm special? No. Every single day, all five chapters, carefully, along with my other Bible reading, not believing that a quantity amount of consuming the word of God will do something for me in it of itself. No. But I want to know the mind of God I want to deepen my fellowship and communion with God. I want to abide with God. I want to have more life, light, and love of God in my life. <clears throat> I want to have more assurance of my salvation. I want to pass those tests when applied to me by God in the spirit. I want to have more joy in the Holy Spirit in my life. I want the Holy Spirit to bear witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I don't want to flounder from day to day in terms of renewing the heart knowledge of Jesus Christ in my, in my life. And therefore, I go to a book in the Bible like 1 John, which condenses and presents to me every single major truth and big idea and theme that is closest to the heart of God, that is the will of God and the burden of God for his church and for his people individually. I have that book going through my mind. Now, what I'm going to do is, this is the first time I've done this, maybe ever, and or for a very long time. I'm going to give you some, some homework, okay? It's voluntary, because I'm not going to have you do this uh, on the basis of mandating it, okay? You can order or you can audit this course for the next week, the Pastor Joe's course on 1 John. All right, set aside some time. Here's, here's the homework. I'm not going to test you on it. This is just for your own personal benefit, but I think it will enhance your understanding of this study in 1 John. Read the book of 1 John every day, beginning tomorrow. I'm not going to be a hard taskmaster. Because some of you are on the East Coast, and right now, Brother Mark Bearden, who's with us, is at 11 o'clock at night almost, <laughs> okay? Read the book of First John starting tomorrow, so that would be six days for the next six days until next Wednesday, the next Bible study. Pray while you read. Ask the Lord to open your heart and your eyes to his truth. Read it carefully. Not, don't rush when you read. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to you. Ask him to enhance and expand upon the things that you learned tonight and in previous studies on 1 John and see, believe that he will reveal this, these deeper truths to you and apply them to your life and see if he does not give you an enhanced understanding of what we're talking about by next Wednesday when we come back together. See if it doesn't add to your Bible study, all right? I'm not going to give you a lot of homework like this moving forward, but read the book of First John. These are not long chapters. Chapter two is 20 some verses. Chapter four is 20 some verses, but the rest of them are, are like 
15 and under verses. Don't worry about the quantity. Just walk with God and seek the Lord for the knowledge of Christ. Ask him to open your heart and your eyes, okay? All right, let's, uh, and don't worry, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. I'm not gonna say how many of you read the book. I'm not gonna, don't worry. Don't, uh, I want you to do this because you want to do this and because it's your pleasure to do it, okay? All right, that ends our study for tonight. And uh, I have more to say, but I want to uh, try to end a little bit uh, sooner uh, than we normally do to take some questions uh, tonight. Uh, let's, um, I'm going to ask Pastor Owen, are you with us? Yeah, there you are. Can you close us in yeah. a brief word of prayer, please? Yes. Let's pray, everybody. Father, what a tremendous provision you have left your church in First John. And in just a little short book, we're able to get right at the heart of God and see the big picture. Um, truly, as the psalmist said, at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. Well, help us to stay at thy right hand that we might derive that joy and that blessedness from walking with you. And uh, these, these principles and the light like the love of um, you um, and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit applying them to our hearts uh, might be our portion in this life until we make it uh, until we make it to heaven when these things will be such of a super reality um, in our life give us a foretaste we pray for that thank you father for the study we thank you um, in jesus name amen amen okay this is our time where at the end of the study we open it up for questions and comments for a few minutes. So <clears throat> we covered a good amount of material, not too much, but we focused on and isolated some truths that I trust will uh, and have resonated with you. Again, it's uh, what a blessing it is to have some of our brothers and sisters in Christ to join us tonight from Bay Area Agape Fellowship. This is a very, very precious body of believers who meet in, uh, I believe it's in Fremont, right? In Fremont. And um, Rebecca, are you still with us? <clears throat> Maybe you yeah, can- yeah, uh, Yes, I am. I yes, want, I am. On behalf of Christ Bible Church and the other brothers and sisters tonight, I want to express our delight uh, that you and the others have joined us and uh, welcome you. And um, we, uh, in many ways, are a sister church with you. And it is my blessed pleasure from time to time to minister the word of God to many of you uh, at the church. And uh, so welcome. I see uh, Lido and May Alcid are with us from Agape. Yes. And, so, and uh, some of the others are with you, uh, Ben yes. Lee. Yes. Oh, ben. Ben's my brother. Yeah, oh, ben, brother. Ben's my brother, and he lives in Salt Lake City, which is one hour ahead of us. Oh, Ben, I should have yeah. known with the same last name. Forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All Jewish name, Benjamin, Rebecca, and we have another brother, Jesse and Aaron. <laughs> there you go. All Bible names. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're all Jewish now. We're all the people of God, right? Yes, <laughs> In that sense. Yes, absolutely. So, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Pastor Owen, are you still with us? Yeah, there he is. Do you have any thoughts? Yes, I'm, still, I'm still By here. By the way, let me just, uh, before you say, I want to introduce Pastor Owen because we have a number of uh, newer participants. Pastor Owen is uh, also a pastor at Christ Bible Church along with me and uh, he and his wife, Lori. And uh, so we want to introduce them to you at Bay Area Agape Fellowship. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, I, I appreciate the study tonight um, and, and the companion verse, a couple of the ones that you shared, of course, uh, the one I, I mentioned in my prayer, uh, is it Psalm 16 or Psalm 110? I get those two mixed up. but. Uh, at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. And as we stay at the right hand of Christ, staying close in fellowship, like, like you mentioned uh, tonight, uh, Joe, 
a natural byproduct of that is joy unspeakable, King James, joy unspeakable and full of glory. So um, uh, thank you for the study. I had uh, that particular verse in my notes further on down in the study, but I only got about halfway through the study. I have about 20 other verses on joy to share with you next time, God willing. Um, I wanted to linger on this verse for a little bit, uh, maybe a, a couple of weeks, uh, today and next week. But uh, if any of you ever want a copy of my notes on any of the studies that we do, just send me an email, <clears throat> joejakowitz at, e at gmail.com, or you can go to our website at uh, christbiblechurch.org and send me an email through our website um, and just request a copy of the of my entire notes for the study. Because uh, I know some of you are note takers and maybe you're paying attention to the study and you maybe uh, have missed a verse or something that, uh, so just, I'll send you my notes on the study and we'll have all the, all the verses there. <clears throat> uh, Brother Will Brown, who is a deacon at Christ Bible Church for over 20 years, and he and his wife Janet have joined us, said, Will, do you have any thoughts on the joy of the Lord? There's only one place to get joy anywhere in the whole universe, because joy is a gift from God. And uh, you don't want any replacement joys because they're fake and deceiving, but the joy of the Lord is, as we read in the scriptures, gives strength. Amen. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? It could be on this topic or now let's open up to any topic whatsoever about the Bible, maybe a verse in the Bible that you've been wrestling with or a question, an issue, a relationship issue or, or something, uh, keeping it discreet uh, or on any topic. Uh, we'll endeavor to relate, God willing, the Bible to whatever the, whatever the question is. Uh, this is Mark. One of my uh, verses that I that I cling to is Psalms 35. And that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And it's one of those things as we deal with these trials and tribulations, and it seems to get dark at, at, at times that God encourages us that joy is gonna come in the morning. And, and, and when I think of that morning, if we talk about the morning star, is that talking about Jesus? Is that, you know, uh, uh, that phrase the way it's written, you know, that joy comes in the morning and, and Christ is referred to as that morning star. Amen, brother. Joy comes in the morning. Yep, there's different kinds of joy. There's joy that comforts us in our tribulations. And there's joy that comes when one sinner repents. Someone perhaps we've been witnessing to and gets saved. And there's all different kinds of reasons to have joy. Amen. Does anybody have some joy they want to share with us that God has blessed them with? Maybe an answer to prayer. And uh, maybe recently today, yesterday, day before, or recently where you had a lot of joy over something. All right. Well, if there's no questions or comments, um, what a blessing it is to see all of you again. We encourage you to uh, feel welcome to invite uh, others. We're going to continue on verse four next week. We'll finish up verse four on the topic of joy. We're also going to expand a little bit more on how joy relates to fellowship and, and the themes of abiding with Christ. And uh, the other themes we talked about, the big ideas from 1 John. And uh, so uh, feel free to, to bring others, like our sister Rebecca invites, uh, to invite others. Send them a link to the study, uh, which you can find on YouTube. Go to Christ Bible Church's YouTube site, and you can cut and paste the link at the top in an email and send that link to several, maybe five, 10, 15 friends, and they can listen to the study. Uh, and then uh, you can send them 
the email invitation that you received, which has the link, the Zoom link to the study, because it's, the Zoom link is always the same address and they can uh, come and, and join us. Okay, that would, that would be appreciated. Daria, hi, good to see you. How are you tonight? Hi, Pastor Joe. I'm good. I was just gonna share how I do have a lot of joy since my daughter was born. Um, I think it added a lot of joy to my life. But um, also sometimes I do feel like Martha, like, like on Wednesday you were talking about Christians who serve a lot and don't just sit down in the seat of, at the feet of Christ. Sometimes being a mom is so busy that I don't necessarily have the quiet time for myself. So I do feel like maybe it's just a season in life to be like Martha, but it will change eventually. Nothing mm -hmm. I can do about it now. Well, that's, that's our hope is and when, when we all have that tendency to be a Martha, but that the Lord plants his seed in us. That is when we get saved, he gives us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And the Holy Spirit changes us and makes us a new creation in Christ. And um, so my point is that we, we do have a war against sin and a struggle, but um, the, the bad news, there's bad news and good news. The bad news, is that the, the biggest no-no in the Christian life is to be a Martha. That's the worst thing that could happen to a Christian. Um, physical health problems and other problems, persecution, suffering, is not the worst thing that can happen to a Christian because um, the joy and peace of God and the love of God is, is always our compensation in those circumstances. But when we become a Martha, we lose the most important, precious thing we have is conscious daily fellowship with Christ and the assurance and peace and communion that brings with it, okay? Um, so that's the worst thing that can happen is to shift your focus and temporarily stop fellowshipping with God and get caught up with worldly cares and shift your focus from Christ to religiosity and to churchianity. That is exchange your fellowship and close walk with Christ for the substitute of religion to salve your conscience. So the worst thing that could happen is to become a Martha where you stop fellowshipping with God and you exchange that fellowship for serving God and just going to church thinking it's a substitute that will, that will suffice. That's the worst thing that can happen. So whenever you get there, Daria, or any of us, including myself, you know you're in the worst possible circumstance you can be. And it's probably accompanied with blindness and forgetfulness that you don't even realize you're in that terrible situation. The, here's the good news. Ready for the good news? The good news is that the Lord knows that and he knows we get caught in the quicksand of that blindness and that deceitfulness, temporary deceitfulness. And there are so many powerful, precious promises in the Bible where God promises to pull us out of that Martha state and condition and bring us back into the land of the living and to restore the joy of the Lord, to restore the love of God, to renew a sense of the preciousness and value that we had temporarily lost in our fellowship with God. Let me give you one such promise. Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will restore their land. 
Let me give you another promise. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Here it is. He restores my soul. Let me give you another promise. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Or no, 1 John 2, uh, verse 1. Here's another phrase. This is from 1 John. It's another one of those, these things that I have written to you phrases. Another purpose statement in 1 John. Brethren, these things have I written to you that you sin not. Don't become the Martha. I'm writing to you that you don't become the Martha. Don't sin, Christian. And, continuing, if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if you do fall into that Martha mentality and lifestyle temporarily, where you shift from fellowship to serving, just going through the motions, and you're not happy, you're miserable. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ promises he will pray for us. He will restore us as the good shepherd. He restores our soul. And he will pour floods of life, light, and love on the dry ground of our hearts again. And plant our feet back on <clears throat> the strong ground of fellowship with him. And so in our serving, we will have re re joy return. And we will no longer be the Martha, we'll be the Mary who first, who does the first works by sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him and walking with him and enjoying our fellowship with him. Hi, Pastor Joe. This is Didi. Um, Hi, Didi. Hello. Can I chime in for what? um Dasha is saying you know being a mom it's not easy and especially when when you have a toddler and I understand where you're saying but when a mother's I mean her situation right Dasha that it would be harder to be in fellowship with God and with the other believers when you have a baby right I agree. I mean, it's not being a Martha for the reason of being a Martha. As a mom, I know God has entrusted me and lent me my children. Excuse me. Um, um, so I have certain responsibilities towards my children. When my children are older, then I can... I mean, I'm not saying like I don't fellowship with other believers or be my time is not as much like now my my children are older. I can be with the Lord and with the brethren way more than a mother. Um, so being a Martha, I mean, I pass through that stage, uh, Dasha. So, you know, I understand where you're coming from. Well, I understand, too where you're coming from. I was a father of five children. My wife is a mother of five children. We have an ongoing ministry with our children. Yeah. There are, there are mothers, particularly mothers in situations like Daria described. There are other situations which cause believers to have a more intensified schedule that they wouldn't necessarily have under different circumstances. Oh. And my heart goes out to you, Daria because it's difficult but yeah. every christian everyone not just mothers has intensified things come up in their life at one time or another whether it's running after a toddler or working 60 70 hours a week in the bay area two jobs to provide for a family as a breadwinner and you have maybe just a couple of hours a day of discretionary time and by the time you get to your devotions, you're physically exhausted um, or any other number, dozens and dozens of situations that are equivalent to Daria's situation where her energy and her time are consumed and 
her, uh, she's challenged and tested to, to have the will and the determination to no matter what, what happens, she's gonna stay up late or she's gonna get up early enough or find time when her daughter naps to no, get with the no. Lord, even, even so any, anybody, every believer is being no. tested by a, a similar situation where our time that we may be used to have to fellowship with God for hours and hours is suddenly taken away. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see Daria's situation as unique where she has, she can say like a Martha, you know, I'm in a, I'm in an unusual situation and therefore um, it's, it's going to be like this for a while. And I can only read a verse a day. Um, the Bible doesn't allow mm -hmm. for such for such uh, situations where we can forsake. When we read Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. We have a picture there of a believer um, who does not, does not go into the presence of the world, does not bring into the world into his life. He only has so much time anyway. He's redeeming the time. He shuts out the world. But regardless of our lifestyle, how busy it is, how exhausting it may be with little children or at work or working 70 hours a week, like, like Isa does or whatever, sit, whatever his schedule is, um, the difference with a believer is that he or she delights in God. Amen. And Amen. that believer is going to find a way through the wisdom of God He's going to find the time to meditate on the, on the law of the Lord day and night. He's going to find a half hour here, an hour there, a few minutes there. He's, and even when he's, he's uh, not reading or praying, he's maintaining his fellowship with the Lord so closely with a clear conscience that the word of God is on his mind. And when he's doing other duties that he or she must do, He's meditating on the things of the Lord. So he's even Amen. using that discretionary time, not discretionary, even that time that he's driving or shopping or something mm -hmm. to meditate on the things of the Lord. So none of us have, you know, though our hearts go out to you, Daria, as I do, um, and as anyone else, um, there's no excuse. No excuse. The child of God who has the spirit of God in him or her is driven by desire to find a way mm -hmm. and we have to use wisdom too you have to use wisdom daria so when when josephine goes down for a nap you got a choice you're exhausted uh are you going to take a nap too or are you going to use 10 15 minutes of that nap to read the word uh you know what time she gets up in the morning usually maybe not the same time every morning are you going to get up when she gets up and start your day frazzled or are you going to set the alarm clock and get up an hour earlier and spend a half hour in the word and a half hour prayer so that when she wakes up you're ready for her spiritually you're 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 got layers of spiritual fortification ready to deal with uh, her, her thing when she goes to sleep at night if she's going to sleep when she wants to go to sleep well then your husband and you need to sit down and send talk and say we need to figure out a plan you need to come up with the wisdom of God to make her go to bed earlier. So instead of going to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, when she goes to bed and finally goes to bed, we're going to have to go through this one or two month process where we're going to have to train her to go to sleep at a certain time. We're going to have to discipline her if she doesn't until she does, even if she just lays there in bed. So that by eight o'clock at night or whatever time you guys decide as parents, we're going to have two to three more hours before we go to bed to be able to mm -hmm. pray together or to be able to read the word individually and pray. And so that you're reading, you find the time morning, 
noon and night to meditate on the word of God. That's how you do it. You need wisdom and discipline. You need these practical things, redeeming the time. Um, every hour matters mm. in the day of a Christian. Every single hour matters if you want to be someone whom the Bible describes as a godly Christian who has answered prayer, who has assurance of salvation frequently, who has more of the joy and peace of God in his or life, her life than they will ever know. That is reflective, reflective of a disciplined Christian life. Such a believer who lives a godly lifestyle like that cannot afford to waste one hour a day. We only have two or three or four discretionary hours for most of us, unless you're retired, like Brother Mark Bearden, who's blessed. But you got to be careful that you don't fill up your schedule with make work things that are vain and frivolous and full of entertainment, because then your mind gets dumbed down and you lose the joy of the Lord. So it's your, what, what, you know, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's a matter of that. I don't mean to be harsh or cruel. I certainly sympathize with you. And I can relate to the pain. You know, your flesh, Daria. I could just see you there, Daria. You love the Lord. I know you love the Lord. You love the Lord and your flesh is crying out. And you, you want to go read the word. But you have this daughter here. You love her. And she's just wasting your time. And, you're, you know, and, and she won't listen to you at times. And, and it's just it's so frustrating. And, and you know, what do you do? Some of it is beyond your control. But the first thing you have to do is get the situation under control that you have control over and reduce, reduce the squandered time to an absolute bare minimum uh, to the time that you have no control over, um, where you have to do certain things with Josephine and you have to. But milk, milk and filter out probably the wasted time and have the strength of will to do it. Mm -hmm. Say, I want God to be number one in my life. I don't even want my daughter or my husband or my wife or my job as important as family and um, making a living is and all these things. They cannot replace God. And I need strength from God and determination that they won't. And therefore I'm gonna have to say no I'm going to have to say no to a close family member. I'm going to have to say no to the world. I'm going to have to turn off the videos. I'm going to have to turn my head down to my Bible from a screen and read my Bible. It's simply as a, as a matter of that. Do you think the, the Holy Spirit's going to flood back in? by competing with the world, we're bringing the world in and then we're gonna to try to bring him in. You cannot serve God and mammon. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. He's, who, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world will make himself an enemy of God. Do we wanna be true Christians? Or do we wanna be, uh, we can be true Christians by, uh, and, and be backslidden but are you willing to sacrifice fellowship with God for it and the joy of the Lord for it? That's walking on very dangerous ground when you do that because you tempt the Lord and you become presumptuous on his grace. And that's really what get God's, gets God angry. When you say, oh, I'll sin, that grace may abound. You know, I'm a Christian. I can do it all at once. I can live a double life, entertainment here and the world there and then Maintain the joy of the Lord. See if you can maintain the joy of the Lord while you're entertaining the world 24 seven. Mm -hmm. While the whole time you're grieving the Holy Spirit because you're looking upon the things of the world and the thoughts of the world are going through your mind instead of meditating on the things of Christ all the time. And the Bible says that God is angry with, with such a professing Christian because God is not in all their thoughts. How do we get God in all of our thoughts? By getting all of his thoughts in us, by reading the Bible and meditating on it day and night. 
And that's what motivates us to pray. I hear, I have so many Christians that I counsel who come to me and say, Pastor Joe, I need counseling. I don't know how to pray as I ought. And yes, I pray that all the time to God myself. But the inability to pray is greatly reduced to a bare minimum when we fill our minds and hearts with the word of God day and night and cut out the world, because that's when the Holy Spirit draws near to us and prompts us to pray, teaches us how to pray, and puts God's petitions on our heart to pray those prayers that God wants us to pray according to his will. That's how it's done. I love you. <laughs> you know I do. But it's hard doctrine. Sanctification and practical Christianity is hard doctrine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I have to say something uh, about Dasha. With our group meeting with the, the ladies' prayer, Dasha is there every single time. And she will be one of the first. So I know exactly her heart. So probably prayers are due for Dasha to be able to, I mean, be less Martha or, you know, kind of God will um, guide her how she can serve him and serve her family. And I agree with you, Didi. And that is an appropriate word of commendation for Daria. Even though we have our spiritual struggles, there are some believers who are like clockwork and faithful to God in most other things. The difference is, and, and, I, and I address Daria now, because I know Daria too. The difference is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the solutions and remedies for these frustrating things to want to be more godly, but we have a schedule mm. or a situation with us the solutions and the wisdom the, we need to get victory and to get triumph and to conquer over these things, Daria, that you just described is found in the cross. So the answer that I gave you is one thing, but the victory over it so that you're, you're, be, you're able to spend the time that you want, as I described and defined before you, is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have all the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So he awaits for you to pray to him, to trust in his blood, his shed blood, to realize that a huge application of his death on the cross is only for Christians, not only for unbelievers to save them and to justify them, but his shed blood was also, is, was also shed in applying to Christians who, who go to him and believe in him for the answers and solutions to tough questions, to stubborn issues that we keep stumbling over, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you tap into his, the grace of his cross and, and that he awaits to give you as his child, as a believer, the solution and the wisdom and the knowledge and the remedy for your specific situation will come. It will come. And you will get the victory through Christ, um, Christ's um, prayers for you, for his shed blood for you, to make you more victorious and mature as his child. But you must believe in the work of his cross. And he knows, go to him. Believe in him and, and the answers await and the discipline and the strength and the insight to apply it. Will, you know, it'll come to you. The wisdom will come to you and you'll find yourself strong and you'll take your daughter, you'll sit her, sit her down and the light will shed, will come into your heart. And this is what you're going to have to say. And the, and the wisdom will come and you will go to your husband and you'll talk about it and you'll say, here's my problem. I need help. Would you pray with me? And, you know, and then you and your husband will come up with a solution and uh, you will, you will sit down with your daughter and you'll, you'll have a transition with her, but you, in the solution, you will have the strength and the confidence of will to know that this is the answer from God.
because his word confirms it. His word gives you direction on it. His word is promising you some things. You got the wisdom from it and you know it's all tied into the cross, all tied into the cross because you pray to him that his blood and his wisdom would be given to you as his child. And you prayed every day and you waited every day for the answer and for the courage to work it out with your husband. And you, you know now where to go and things are not iffy and they're not you know, unclear and ambiguous. They're, they're really clear and you're just gonna stay the course and you're gonna trust him for the grace until the, the, it's fully, the application of remedy is fully implemented. It's gonna be hard. It's not going to be easy for the flesh, but if you know God's will, his perfect will, and the wisdom and answer is given to you, and the promise is given to you for help from him, then you're going to stay the course, and you're, you're not, if people don't like it, they don't like it, you know, pray for love, pray for patience for those who don't agree with you, but it's got to be done because you know it's the will of God, be humble, be loving, be charitable, be patient under the pressure, but stick to your guns because you know it's the will of God. It's God's command to you. And you would rather suffer loss from people than displease God when you know to do right in an area and you don't do it. Your conscience will, uh, will be afflicted by it. One of the things I've learned raised in Paige was maybe she didn't understand many things being young but uh, she would see me on my knees praying and I and talking to God and and then she would talk to God she would pray and uh, one of the joys that came out of that is like wow my daughter's learning how to talk to God by looking at me and and yes kids are going to be antsy and kids are going to not be a uh, full focus but I'll tell you a, a daily dose of that when they see you uh, giving your heart to God and explaining to them, it, they might not understand it, but they're going to look at that example and they're going to want to imitate their parent. And, and, and when they start talking to God, it can just give you joy knowing that God, my child is learning to talk to you. And that's the most important thing. Amen. That's a great example, Brother Mark. Thank you. And this is, I'm gonna, this is the last thing I'm going to say to you, Daria, before I have to go now. The very fact, Daria, that your heart is burdened about this issue and your heart is burning with the desire to spend more time with God in prayer and in Bible reading, even though it's hard for you to get as much out of your devotions as you want to when you pray and read. And even though you're not spending the time that you want to in there, God has put that on your heart to not let this issue go. And by faith, you're seeking answers, you're pursuing solutions. That by itself is from God. So you are on the right path. And let me encourage anyone else of you who have situations of frustrating situations where you want to go deeper with God, but you come up with these satanic attacks of the enemy. You come up with all these areas of weakness and, and stumbling blocks and snares and frustrations that you can't get over and seem to, to get more of that joy and spend more time with the Lord and get more fulfillment and gratification out of your relationship with God. Let me encourage you, number one, that the very fact that these issues won't die in you and you're not going to give up, even though you're kind of in the quicksand and paralyzed with, with uh, fr frustration, you keep sending up those prayers. You keep crying out to God for help. You keep asking him for wisdom and God will not let you down because God says, I, it, it, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And it's a sign that God is working in you to eventually overcome these things. So don't give up, Daria, okay? Pray about it every day. Even if you can't get away for a longer period by yourself because of Josephine, when you do take five minutes here or 30 seconds here, a minute here and send up a prayer to the Lord, make it a sincere prayer. 
Let there be fervency and urgency in it. Let there be desperation in it. Tell the Lord that you, you're not going to be able to do this and, and fellowship with him like you want to unless he helps you. Remind him that he's God. He knows your need. He knows your situation. Go just pour out your heart to him every day in one way or another. And, and you know, make sure you, your sins are confessed. And, uh, but do that every day and you will see an answer little by little to, to these prayers and you will see your desire fulfilled to, to spend a lot of time with God. All right? And listen to this study again. Go over it again if you have to, two, three, four times. Certain truths have to be burned deeply within us because we're very forgetful. Go over it again. Look up some of the verses that were given, some of the counsel that we gave you. Because this is not my word. This is God's word, God's promise to you. Why? Because he loves you. He's your child. You're his child. And in this most important area of his will for you and for me, we know what, what he wants us to do. And everything he commands us to do in the Bible, he gives us the skill and the gift and the power and the open door and the opportunity and the ability to do it. Again, God does not frustrate nor tease us saying, do this and, not, and then not enable us to do it and to do his will. Tell him you're weak, you're helpless, you're hopeless to do it unless he helps you. But if you cast yourself on his mercy, if you cast yourself completely on him for the strength you need to do it all, he will look at you with eyes of pity as a father pities his children. So the Lord pities those that fear him for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Father in heaven, I pray for my dear sister Daria Lord, you know her heart, her desire. And I pray for my other brothers and sisters, for all of us who are in the same boat. We want to spend more time with you and your word, more fellowship with you. We love you, Lord. We want to know you. You are our great reward. You are our inheritance. You and your love and joy and your presence in our hearts and lives are, are the greatest thing we desire. So hear us, Lord. Give us the solutions, the wisdom, the leadership, the, the, the strength to resist everything that would keep us from, from spending more time with you and your word and prayer. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. God willing, um, next Wednesday at 6.30, please try to join the prayer meeting if you can. If you can't, I understand it because some of you folks may be meeting up, may be inviting others. Send them the link to the study we did. It's going to be, uh, rec it's recorded. It'll be on YouTube. It will also be on Facebook and you can send people links. Let's, uh, let's send out a call for people to flee to Christ and to cling to Christ in these end times by sending out links to these studies. And also uh, Sunday, this Sunday at one o'clock, for those of you who are able to visit our prayer meeting at Christ Bible Church and our two o'clock worship service, uh, I'm gonna be continuing my study in the one o'clock hour on prayer and revival, something related to it. And then at the two o'clock message will be on the gospel of John. We're going through the companion book of the gospel of John on Sundays when I speak. Don't forget Pastor Owen's series on Jonah. He's going through the book of Jonah every other week, and I'm doing the Gospel of John. Lord bless you, everybody. I love you guys, and uh, may the Lord keep you, okay? Press on. We only have one life to give to Christ. You see, it's not how you start that matters. It's how you finish. So run that you may finish the race. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Joe. Thank you. We, we are Amen. happy to be here. God yes. bless you. Yes. And my, yes. my greetings to the Bay Area Agape Fellowship. Yes. Thank oh, you, you guys Thank are you. Agape, all right. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Joe. Okay. Thank you.